blue and red. All right, let me give you all the knuckle bones because uh, because that you're the first group that has all got that immediately. <laughs> Everybody's like, uh, uh, so, <laughs> so you get these two colors, put them together. Well, the red came through. Where's the blue? It's on the soil. So why is it staying in the soil? It's negatively charged. It's got a charge. And so with kids, you start there, talk about magnets. What happens with magnets? The like charges repel each other. Apart. The, positive, the unlike charges, opposite charges, attract. So we've got another way to tell what the charge on the soil is. So I've got a slurry of clay, a night clay, and I've got a battery. I've got my electrodes hooked up, and I'm going to look and see what happens to the soil. What? And then, so if you've seen them, you also know about hungry, naked, and homeless. Oh my gosh. Have you done that one? You so. You talk with kids and people from cities that have no clue that your food comes anywhere from other than the grocery store. So you take, what's, what's your favorite, favorite food? <laughs> All right, hello everyone. My name is Patrick Pines. I'm from Cal Poly. And um, I'd like to pose a hypothetical question to you guys first. Um, say you're a farm in the Midwest and there's a silo off to the side of the farm. It's been there for about 120 years. It was painted in lead paint and it's uh, weathering and deteriorating. Would you imagine that lead from that silo to be right there underneath that point source of lead? Or could it be possible that that lead could spread further away from that point source, away into your field, per se? Right here. And the conclusion is that if you have a point source around off your farm, you need to be thinking about that. You need to be thinking that it's not going to be focused right underneath that point source. It's possible that that, that wind that wind's going to blow that lead into your field at high concentrations. Like, As you can see, the curve of my humic acid data is above the curve of my distilled water data. That means that resin MN250 actually does better at removing sulfamethazine while in the presence of humic acid. Right, uh, my name is Veronica. Uh, the project that I had done um, this past semester actually was looking at the effect of plant growth regulators and nitrogen fertilization on the partitioning of red clover growth. This study was focusing on the fungal pathogen frog eye leaf spot, um, Cercrosper sogena, and it's a foliar disease in soybeans. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Williams. My family has been farming in Nebraska since 1854. My grandfather, Levi Rakes, settled our farm at its present location near Ashland at the turn of the last century. And ever since then, we've called it the home place. Now, I tell you this story, the story of our farm, in some detail, because it is the story of how the work you do helps farmers succeed and feed the world. It's the story of my family's farm, yes, but it's also the story of how you've revolutionized the way farming is done over the past century. There's one other thing I find interesting about this story. It might sound like an American story. The Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, land-grant universities, the USDA, the U.S. Soil Conservation Service, hybrid corn, but it's actually a human story. It's the story of people working hard to move from barely surviving to thriving. And in that way, it's a story that applies just as much to the 500 million farms in developing countries as it does to the 2 million farms here in the United States. Focusing on the billions of farmers who haven't yet benefited from your amazing expertise is how we're going to be able to repeat my father's story, my father's success story, millions and millions of times around the world. And when that happens, we will have realized the great promise of agriculture and agricultural science to make people's lives better, their futures brighter, and their world which is our world more secure. So thank you very much for taking on this grant.